The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication, podcast publishing made easy, Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Welcome to the Old Time Radio Network Adventures. What adventures awaits our heroes? Let's go back to the early days of radio and our imaginations to our featured presentation. Stardust by Neil Gaiman tells the story of being challenged to retrieve a fallen star by the beautiful Victoria Forrester, to whom he has lost his heart. Tristan Thorne leaves his home in the sleepy English village of Wall and crosses into the mysterious and magical land of Fairy. But when Tristan locates the fallen star he discovers it is no mere meteorite, but an injured young woman, Yvaine. Tristan, however, is not the only person to have seen and be in pursuit of the fallen star. Deep in Fairy, Morwanig the Witch Queen is also hunting the star whose heart she plans to cut out to restore youth to herself and her sisters. High on Mount Huan, Primus, Tertius and Septimus, the three living heirs to the realm of Stormhold, seek out the star to claim the right to their recently deceased father's kingdom, and each will stop at nothing, not even murder, to ensure they are the only brother left in the running for the throne. With Yvain's life in danger, she and Tristran find themselves embarking on an extraordinary adventure, full of danger and intrigue as they flee across fairy. Encountering little hairy men, witches, and lightning-hunting sky pirates along the way, Tristran is about to uncover the secret to his own identity and a fate beyond his wildest dreams at his journey's end. Written by Neil Gaiman and narrated by Eleanor Bron, it's part one of Stardust. Time, the thief, eventually takes all things into his dusty storehouse, where the tapestry of the ages is kept. To journey through the tapestry, we must first unpick a thread. But which thread do we choose? And where? And when? Consider the world of Fairy, where I was born. Maps of Fairy are unreliable, and time passes differently there. Fairy is bigger than the world of humans. For each land that has been forced off the map by explorers going out and proving it wasn't there, has taken refuge in Fairy. It is now a huge place indeed, containing every manner of landscape and terrain. Here, high in the fastnesses of fairies Mount Huon, a fortress is carved, like a hole in a rotten tooth. Inside, my father, the 81st Lord of Stormhold, lies dying in his bedchamber. He is not alone. His living sons, Primus, Tertius and Septimus wait by the right side of his deathbed. And those unmoving grey figures on the other side are my dead brothers, Secundus, Quintus, Quartus, and Sextus. <sighs> it's cold as the heart of an ice troll in here. Why doesn't the old man just die? Septimus, please, try a selfless act for once. And you're not here to find out who inherits the power of Stormhold, Primus. Tertius? Enough. Septimus. Charming as ever. He probably poisoned our father. Very likely, Secundus. He poisoned me. We should have had our revenge, Quintus. Well, it's too late now. We're dead. This particular thread of our tapestry will keep for a little. There are others to pull at. Come, look at the richness of the world of fairy. Here there be dragons, griffins, wyverns, hippogriffs, basilisks, and hydras. But there are places where other, more fell creatures lurk, away from the light. The clearing in which this cottage lies is so dank and fetid. One cannot imagine it was ever a pleasant, sun-dappled glade. But once upon a time it was, until the Lilium, the Witch Queens, came to dwell in this place and turned it to darkness. Shh. Let quietly now. These three sleeping hags are the Witch Queens, and our presence may be detected. You nod. The cottage is one room, undivided. A peat fire burns in the large fireplace. There are three raised beds upon which the witches sleep. 
here, near the cauldron, are cooking implements. And this large wooden cage. It is empty, so we are spared the piteous whimperings of a child meant for the pot. Cut his living heart out. <laughs> Hmm. I do not think this is the place to begin our journey either. The first thread we must pick up lies deeper in the past, in the world of humans. It is the evening of April the 29th, 1837. Young Queen Victoria is on the throne of Great Britain, and the evening sun shines over the English village of Wall which has stood on this jut of granite for the last 600 years. There to the north is the inn, the seventh magpie. Immediately to the east is a high gray rock wall from which the town takes its name. Built of hewn granite, this wall emerges from the woods and goes back into the woods with just one break in it, an opening about six feet in width. For hundreds of years, the villagers have posted guards at the opening, like the two lads you see here, to stop anyone from going through, and otherwise have done their best to put it out of their minds. But tonight is the eve of May Day, and once every nine years on May Day, the guard is relaxed. Tomorrow, the great fairy market comes to the meadow. For on the other side of the wall lies the world of Faerie, and there is for one day and one night commerce between the nations, which packs the village with visitors of all hues from many countries. It's the furners I can't stand. The village is full of them. The lad with the black eye is Tommy Forrester. It's only every nine years the village profits from it. The lad with the nut-brown hair and freckles is Dunstan Thorne. Oh! My noggin hurts. It will do that, if you put it in the way of a stranger's fist. Filthy furner and the seventh magpie. Trying to steal a kiss from Motty Bridget. Well, you can't expect the pot wench at the inn not to attract attention. She's the loveliest girl in Wall. Yeah, not a patch on my daisy. Tacey Emstock will be an old maid by the time you pluck up courage to wed her. You want a matching pair of black eyes? <laughs> at the end of the shift, Another two able-bodied young men of the village arrive, carrying a lantern each. Tommy and Dunstan walk down to the inn, where Mr. Bromios, the landlord, gives each of them a mug of his best ale. Here you are, boys. Which is very fine indeed, as their reward for doing guard duty. Oh, that ale is the stuff of life. I can see my Bridget at the bar. I'm off to seal a kiss. Don't start any more fights. This seat free? That it is, sir. My friend was called away on business and left his pudding. Will you eat it? <laughs> With a ready will, sir. And may I say what a very fine black silk top hat that is? Why, thank you. Mm. Actually, I'm trying to find a place to set it for the night. Every room in the village that can be let has already been let. Is that so? Would you know of a house that might have a room? Hmm. Well, then, I have a cottage on the edge of my father's land. It was our shepherd's cottage until he died two years ago, last Lammas tide, and they gave it to me. Will you take me to it? Hmm. Aye, why not? Well, look inside. I've no need. Come, Dunstan Thorn. I'll rent it from you for the next three days. And what will you give me for it? A golden sovereign. More than fair rent. <laughs> True enough. But if you're here for the market, then it's miracles and wonders you'll be trading in that meadow through the wall tomorrow. So, it would be miracles and wonders that you would be after. Your heart's desire, would that be it? Aye, my heart's desire. Sounds about right. Hmm. It's raining. Yes. Very well. Tomorrow you shall attain your heart's desire. Here is your golden sovereign hey. hiding behind your ear. And that's a true sovereign, not fairy gold. Till tomorrow. 
Dunstan walks to the cow buyer in the pelting rain. He climbs into the hayloft and is soon asleep. In the small hours of the morning, Dunstan is woken by somebody treading on his feet. What? Get off. Oh, excuse me. Who's that? Who is it? Uh, it's just me. Uh, I'm here for the market. Uh, I was sleeping outside, but the rain threatened to get into me baggage, and there's, there's things in there must be kept dry as dust. So uh, I was wondering if you'd mind me staying here under your roof. Uh, I'm not very big. Uh, I don't disturb you or nothing. I just don't tread on me. Strap up. <laughs> that was bright. <laughs> a flash of lightning illuminates the buyer, and for just a moment... Dunstan sees something small and hairy laying down on the straw, wearing a large floppy hat. Goodness me, you're a very hairy little man. Indeed, that I am, sir. Good night to you. Good night. What's your name? Oh, oh. Beg pudding. Charming. The day of the fair dawns, bright and sunny. Dunstan wakes late to find the cow buyer empty. At the stroke of midday, Dunstan strides up to the wall and nervously walks through. After just a few paces, he feels a hand on his shoulder. Ah, my landlord. Let us walk together. Did you sleep well in my cottage, sir? That I did, thank you. Are you looking forward to the market today? In truth, I don't know. Last market I went to, I was only a boy. Well, remember to be polite and take no gifts. You're a guest here. And now, I shall give you the last part of the rent that I owe you, for I swore an oath. It is a gift for you and your firstborn child and its firstborn child. And what would that be, sir? Your heart's desire, remember? It is now granted. Is it? Indeed. And now I must away to business. Farewell, Dunstan Thor. I'd help to know what it is. Dunstan walks on through the throng, passing all manner of stalls, jingling his money, thinking what present he might take back to give Daisy Hempstock. The master of Stormhold suffers a mysterious malady. Dunstan begins to think he will never find a present for Daisy. But then he hears something. Dunstan sees a painted caravan with a brightly colored bird chained to it. Nearby is a stall covered with flowers, bluebells and foxgloves and harebells and daffodils and a profusion of others. Each flower is made of glass or crystal and they chime and jingle. He is enchanted and examines them. There does not seem to be anyone attending the store. Hello? Dunstan does not notice the brightly coloured bird is no longer on its perch. He is transfixed by the person who descends from the caravan. It is a girl with deep violet eyes. Her ears, visible beneath her curly black hair, are those of a cat curved and dusted with a fine dark fur. Can I help you, young sir? Uh, yes. Yes, these glass flowers. See, this one, this snowdrop, it's, um, it's very lovely. Uh, how much is it? Oh, the cost is never discussed at the outset. It might be a great deal more than you're prepared to pay, and then you would leave, and we would both be the poorer for it. Let us discuss the merchandise in a more general way. Ah, there you are. Oh, you again, sir. There. My debt to you is settled, and my rent is paid in full. What on earth did he mean? Truly, I have no idea. You are interested in the flowers. They can be given to a loved one as a token of affection, and the sound they make is pleasing to the ear. Also, they catch the light most delightfully, see? This bluebell? A beautiful colour, don't you think? I think the colour of your eyes puts it to shame. 
Um, I can't help noticing. What? The chain that runs from your wrist to the ground and in the caravan. My silver chain. It binds me here. I am the personal slave of Madame Semele, the witch woman who owns this caravan. She caught me many years ago as I played by the waterfalls in my father's lands and popped me into a sack. And you're her slave forever? Not forever. I gain my freedom on the day the moon loses her daughter, if that occurs in a week when two Mondays come together. In the meantime, I do as I am bid. Will you buy a flower from me now, young master? My name is Dunstan. And an honest name it is, too. What's yours? I am a slave, and the name I had was taken from me. Oh. Um, let's see how much I brought. I think I might like to buy that snowdrop there. Oh, we do not take money at this stall. No? What will we take? I could take a kiss from you. One kiss. Here on my cheek. <laughs> that I'll pay with goodwill. There now. And here's your snowdrop. My, my. It's perfect. And I'll see you back here tonight, Dunstanthorn, when the moon goes down. Come here and hoot like a little owl. Can you do that? Yes. Yes, I can. Thank you. Good for nothing. Leaving me to sleep when customers are about. Girl? Here, Madam Semele. Well, go. Make me a posset while I polish the stock. Yes, Madam Semele. Wastra. Oh! Oh, the snowdrop's not here. Girl, where's the snowdrop? The snowdrop? Was there a snowdrop? That night, Dunstan Thorn slips through the gap in the wall and into the meadow, raises his hands to his mouth and hoots. Hoo-hoo! Hoo-hoo! That is nothing like a little owl. Oh. Lie here in the grass with me where it's quiet. Oh, you intoxicate me. Do you think you're under a spell, Dunstan? I do not know. You're under no spell, pretty boy. Lie back and tell me about yourself. What do you want from life? I don't know. You, I think. Well, I want my freedom from this chain. What's it made of? Cat's breath and fish scales and moonlight, all mixed in with the silver. Unbreakable until the terms of the spell are concluded. Oh. Oh, why are you crying? Come here. Hold me. Oh. Oh, my stars. They lie together till dawn's grey light breaks, then the girl arises and straightens her dress, and Dunstan arises and fastens his best breeches. Now get along with you, pretty lad. Here's a kiss to send you on your way. And with that, she walks back into the gypsy caravan behind the stall. On the following day, the market finishes and the foreigners leave the village and life in war returns to normal. Two weeks after the market, Tommy Forrester proposes marriage to Bridget Comfrey and she accepts. And that June, Dunstan Thorne is married to Daisy Hempstock. And if the groom still seems a little distracted, well... The bride is as glowing and lovely as ever any bride has been. First autumn comes, then winter, and it is at the end of February that a wicker basket is pushed through the gap in the wall. The guards on each side of the gap do not notice the basket at first. <laughs> Seth! Seth, wake up, man! Somebody's pushed a basket through the gap! Oh, 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 Lord love us. Poor little mite, he'll freeze. Hang on, what's this say? 
It's a name. Tristram Thorne. When the next fairy market is held, Tristan Thorne, who is eight years old, does not attend. I think himself packed off to stay with extremely distant relations in a village a day's ride away. His little sister, Louisa, six months his junior, is allowed to go, and this is a source of ranklement to the boy. So the days go by, and the weeks go by, and the years go by also. When he is 15, Tristan hurts his arm, falling from the apple tree outside Mr. Thomas Forrester's house. More specifically, outside Miss Victoria Forrester's bedroom window. She is, without any doubt, the most beautiful girl for miles around and used to getting her own way. Oh, sour. Your father's apples look juicy, Louise, but they taste awful. <laughs> They're cookers. <laughs> Boiled up with sugar, they make the sweetest pie. Oh, I shouldn't judge on looks. <laughs> Says Victoria Forrester. <laughs> what does that mean? Mr. Robert Monday himself is counted amongst your admirers. Uh, Mr. Monday is five and forty years of age if he is a day. <laughs> he is a widower besides. I would not wish to marry someone who'd already been married. I would imagine that the advantage of a widower is that by the age of five and forty, their lusts would long since have been sated, which would free one from a number of indignities. <laughs> oh, Victoria! <laughs> Tristan Thorne, at the age of 17, is half the way between a boy and a man. He seems to be composed chiefly of elbows and Adam's apples and is painfully shy. He is a gangling creature of potential, a barrel of dynamite, waiting for someone or something to light his fuse. But no one does. So he works at Monday and Brown's, the village shop, as a clerk. Shop! Oh. Victoria, uh, good day, Miss Forrester. Tristan Thorne, is Mr. Monday not in? Uh, no, he is away fetching supplies and Mr. Brown is doing accounts in the back office. I see. Well then, I have my mother's weekly shopping list. Oh, good, right. Half a pound of sago, ten cans of sardines, mm -hmm. one bottle of mushroom ketchup, five pounds of rice. Half a pound... Oh, why don't I just give you the list? Oh, yeah, thank you. Five pounds of rice. Gee, you'll be having rice pudding then, Miss Forrester? Yes, Tristran. We can deliver most of the provisions tomorrow morning and the rest of it will come back with Mr Monday on Thursday week. Hmm. Yes, I must go. You know, Miss Forrester, I get off in a few minutes. Perhaps I could walk you home? It's, it's not much out my way. Certainly. The autumn twilight turns into deep and early night as they walk. The crescent moon hangs white in the sky, and the stars burn in the darkness above. Victoria? Yes, Tristran? Would you think it forward of me to kiss you? Yes, very forward. Will you kiss me? No. You kissed me when we were younger, beneath the pledge oak on your 15th birthday and last May Day behind your father's cowshed. I was another person then. Well, if you're not kissing me, will you marry me? <laughs> marry you? Why ever should I marry you, Tristan Thorne? There is nothing I would not do for your kiss. No mountain I would not scale, no river I would not ford, no desert I would not cross. Oh! Did you see that falling star? I believe they are not uncommon at this time of year. For a kiss, I'd bring you that fallen star. Go on, then. And if you do, I will. What? If you bring me that star, the one that just fell, then I'll kiss you. Who knows what else I might do? What else? A kiss? Your hand in marriage? If I brought you that fallen star? <laughs> Anything you desire. You swear it? Oh, of course. <laughs> Silly shop boy. And let me go home. 
I shall leave you here, milady, for I have urgent business. To the east! Tristram Thorne runs all the way home. Brambles snag at his clothes as he runs. A branch knocks his hat from his head. Oh, oh, bother! Goodness me! Mother, father! Look at the state of you! Uh, I beg your pardon, father, mother, but I shall be leaving the village tonight. I may be gone for some time. Foolishness and silliness! Give me that torn coat so that I can sew it up. Oh, here. Where are you going? East, through the wall. And and will you be coming back? Of course. And have you given any thought to getting through the wall past the guards? I'll fight them if I have to. You'll do no such thing. Go and pack a bag and kiss your mother and I'll walk you down the village. Tristan tells his father his plan, packs a bag, and his mother brings him apples, a cottage loaf, and a round of cheese. He kisses her cheek and bids her farewell. Then he walks into the village with his father. On wall duty that evening are Harold Crutchbeck and Mr. Bromios, the innkeeper. Evening, Mr. Bromios. Evening, Harold. I believe you both know my son, Tristran. Indeed. Good evening, Tristran. Good evening, Mr. Bromios. Hello, Harold. All right. I suppose you both know about where Tristran came from. All right. They say he was found here, in the gap in the wall. Well, now it's time for him to go back. Very well. Harold, we're letting Tristran through. All right. Well, that was easier than I expected. Now, Tristan, before you go, here's a little something that might come in useful. What is it? It's a snowdrop, all made of glass. It's beautiful. Now, go on with you, boy. Go and bring back your star, and may God and all his angels go with you. Thank you, Father. <laughs> now, go on, you fool. Tristan walks through the gate into the meadow on the other side of the wall. Then, his bag swinging in one hand, the glass snowdrop in the other, Tristram Thorn passes beyond the fields we know and into fairy. Now, Tristram would perhaps never have crossed the wall into fairy if it had not been for the events which, you will recall, took place just hours earlier, the gathering at my father's deathbed. <sighs> Father, we are here. But what would you with us? What I have to say concerns Primus Tertius and Septimus the living. We, the dead, attend out of respect, Father. And in the hope you might throttle Septimus as your last living act. He can't hear you, Sextus. Primus, Tertius, Septimus, this concerns which of you will inherit my title. Which, having been murdered one apiece by you three, my dead sons cannot. That's not quite correct. What? Septimus killed both Quintus and Sextus. He poisoned Quintus with a dish of spiced eels. He pushed Sextus off a precipice. Oh, really? I simply rejected artifice in favor of efficiency and gravity. Quiet! Primus? Yes, sire. Go to the window. As you wish. <clears throat> What do you see? I see the evening sky above us and clouds below us. Tertius, what do you see? This is Primus told you, Father. The evening sky hangs above us, the colour of a bruise, and clouds carpet the world beneath us. Septimus, you? Window, yes, I'm going. Pantomime. What do you see? I see a star, Father. Ah. Now, bring me to the window. Come, Tertius. Oh, got it. <laughs> Steady now. <clears throat> ah. What a performance. Primus, you know the talisman that we call the power of Stormhold? It is the yellow topaz stone you wear upon the chain around your neck, Father. Tertius? He who wears that topaz is Stormhold's master, the 82nd Lord. Septimus, 
I want it. Of course you do. But you forget. I am the Lord of Stormhold, who had defeated the Northern Goblins at the Battle of Cracklands Head, who fathered eight children, seven of the boys, on three wives, who killed each of his four brothers in combat before he was 20 years old. It is that man who breaks this chain, holds up this topaz, and utters the incantation. Est quia omnes appetunt, and then flings this stone into the sky. What? what? The brothers watch as their father flings the stone into the air. It arcs up over the clouds, and then, defying all reason, it continues to rise into the air towards the very stars overhead until it is lost to sight. To him who retrieves the stone, which is the power of Stormhold, I leave my blessing and the mastership of Stormhold and all its dominions. <sighs> and should we capture eagles and harness them to drag us into the heavens? No. Look, a star is falling. Oh, the first star of the evening. Hmm. It's dropping somewhere to the south and the west of us. There. It is done. He's gone. Right, you take the head end. <laughs> Septimus, lend a hand. He's a dead weight. I'm busy. The four dead brothers watch Septimus hmm. as he continues to gaze out of the window. What do you think Septimus is thinking, Secundus? How to murder Primus and Tertius. How to make it look like an accident. You're all wrong. He's wondering where that stone fell. And how to reach it first. I damn well hope so. Oh, oh. Ah, hello, Father. Ah, you see. So that is how the star came to fall, which Tristan has promised to fetch for Victoria Forrester. But it is not only Tristan and Victoria and Lord Septimus who mark its descent. In the dark cottage in the dark woods, where the three sisters dwell, their eldest, Morwanig, who has just retrieved a stoat from a snare and slit the creature's throat, looks up and sees it too. Sisters! Sisters, come quickly! What, sister? What is it? Look. Hey, <gasps> lost. About time. Which of us, then, to find it? I'll open the stoat. Now, each take her knife, close her eyes, and stab. <coughs> eyes open. Of the kidney. Of his liver. I of his heart. How will you travel? In our old chariot, drawn by what I find at the crossroads. You'll be needing some years. Come into the cottage. Here is the box. Open it then. Oh, how the tiny morsel shines and wriggles. Let me have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Again, Morwenig. Lucky thing. But that we were. We will be if she succeeds. When I return with her heart, there will be years of plenty for all of us. A star. A fallen star. The first in 200 years. And I'll bring it back to us. And what of that fallen star? The light in the glade by this pool grows in brightness to the point that each of these fireflies is convinced that this at last is love. But instead... It is a fallen star in the world of fairy. Now it is hours since the star fell, 
and Tristan Thorne has left October in England behind. He is sleepy and lays with his head on his bag and covers himself with his coat. He drifts off. Breakfast! Hey. <clears throat> Who are you, a friend? You will recognise at once the little hairy smell. man Breakfast, lad. who once my shared a hayloft with Tristram's father. Hello. You eat up while I tidy away. That looks good. Mm. Oh, it tastes good. <laughs> well, he says that now, but wait an hour. I know the man in Paphlagonia who'd swallow a live snake every morning when he got up. He used to say he was certain of one thing that nothing worse would happen to him all day. Of course, uh, they made him eat a bowl full of airy centipedes before they hung him, so he was a bit presumptive. Mm. Oh, my name's Tristan Thorne. No, charmed. If not enchanted, ensorcelled and confusticated. Beg your pardon? Well, I used to be confusticated, but you know how these things go. Ready to move on? Good. And so Tristan and the little hairy man walk forward into a patch of woodland, and Tristan tells his companion of his quest. So, what damn fool silly thing has this young lady got you a doing of? Well, we saw this falling star, and I promised to bring her. <sighs> and it fell over there, towards that mountain range. Look, I'd not mention why you're here, if I were you. There's those as would be unhealthily interested in such information. Let's keep mum. I see. Do you think it'll be far to the star? How many miles to Babylon? Uh, how many miles to Babylon? Three score miles and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? Yes, and back again. Yes, if your feet are nimble and light, you can get there by candlelight. That's the one. Well, it's only a nursery rhyme. Only a nursery? Bless me. The sum on this side of the wall would give seven years hard toil for that little cantrip. Uh, and back where you come from, you mutter them to babes alongside of a rockabye baby or rubber dub dub without a second thought. Hang on. What? Where's the path gone? Hey? Eh? Look around you. Can you see the path? Uh, not anymore. Now we're for it. What? Should we run? Uh, not much point. We've walked into the trap and we'll still be in it even if we run. Look. Up in the tree here. There's a bird. A dove? Hand me a pebble. Uh, here. <coughs> oh, it wasn't a dove. Oh, it's the skeleton of a bird. It was picked clean while roosting. Oh, there's no escape by flying. Not judging by that thing. And your sort of people never could learn to burrow. Not that that'd do as much good. Should we arm ourselves? Oh, against the trees themselves. We're in a seer wood. A seer wood? Now, you'll never get your star and I'll never get my merchandise. Oh, if only we knew where the true path was. Even a seer wood couldn't destroy the true path. Just hide it from us, lure us off of it. I... I, I don't know where the path is. It's down that way. Well, how do you know? I just know. Well, come on then, run! No, no, not that way! Oh, over here! To the left! Oh, in the trees! They've uh, uh, arranged themselves into a wall! What this uh, Buck up! We're nearly there! Uh, yes, 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 I see it! Quickly, before this gap closes! Uh, oh, are we safe now? As long as we stay on the path. We can stop here a moment, though. There's stuff we need to talk about. Sit down. Oh. Now, there's something here I'm not properly getting. Where are you from? Wall, I told you. There isn't anything unusual in your family, is there? Enchantresses or warlocks? None that I know of. All right. Which direction is the village of Wall? There. Where are the debatable hills? There. The Catavarian Isles? That way. As vast as the Free Martin Muskish? There. As vast as the Free Martin Muskish's transluminary citadel? Um, shade more that way. And where's this star you're looking for? It's that way. Good. How far, do you think? Six months' walk. How do I know that? You just knows, it seems. And I'll wager you're not the only one who'll be looking for it. 
<laughs> now look, you've saved my life, laddie, back there in the searwood. And let it never be said that I'm a cove what doesn't pay his debts. Now, where is it? Uh, you remember what I told you before? How many miles to Babylon? Uh, can I get there by candlelight and so on? Exactly. It's the candle wax, you see. Most candles won't do it. This one took a lot of finding. Well, there's not much for candle left. Take this silver chain, too. You'll be needing it to bring your sar back with you. What do I do with it? Take up the candle in your right hand. I'll light it. Then you walk to your star. Then tie the star to the chain and bring it back here. There's not much wick left, so you'd best step lively. There. Candle's lit. Won't it blow out? Not unless you want it to. Or it runs out, whichever's first. Ready? I... Uh, you think so? Off you go. Take one step at a time. Just a step? Go on. Bye-bye. Oh, he's gone. No, I've gone. Miles and miles in one step. So, if I take another... <gasps> I'm in the desert! <gasps> Mountains! Oh, it's night already. No, this must be a cave. Hello? Hello? Best not stay here. Hmm, a nice little glade. Oh, but I must press on. Oh, didn't work. Try again. So, the candle's still burning. I must have reached my destination. Who's that? Excuse me. I'm looking for a star. Ouch! Go away. I won't hurt you. Go away. Ugh. Hey, please don't throw any more mud at me. Just go away and leave me alone. Look, I didn't mean to disturb you. It's just there's a star falling somewhere around here. And why are you sitting there like that? I broke my leg. I'm sorry, but there's a star. I broke my leg when I fell. Oh, you're the star. And you're a clodpole and a ninny, a numbskull, a lackwit and a coxcomb. Yes, I suppose I am at that. Here. What's this? A chain slipped round your wrist. What do you think you're doing? I'm taking you home with me. I made an oath. This is honestly nothing personal. I do it for love. Her name, that is the name of my love, is Victoria. Victoria Forrester. She promised me anything that I desired were I to bring her the star that we saw fall the night before last. I was looking for a diamond or a rock. I certainly wasn't expecting a lady. And having found a lady, you have to drag her into your foolishness? For what? Love. Well, I hope you choke on it. Oh, the candle's gone out. So? Can I get there by candlelight there and back again? Oh, shut up. Without candlelight, the village of Wall is six months hard travel from here. Listen. I want you to know that whoever you are and whatever you intend with me, I shall give you no aid of any kind, nor shall I assist you. Um, can you walk? No, my leg is broken. <sighs> Would your kind sleep? Of course, but not at night. At night, we shine. Well, I can't think of anything else to do, so I'm going to try and get some sleep. It's been a long day. Maybe you should try to sleep too. We've got a long way to go. Good night. Dunderhead. Bumpkin. Dolt. Cretinous. Verminous. Oaf. Many leagues away, the three lords of Stormhold ride in a coach pulled by four black horses. Not a way in, my lords! Whoa! The chambermaids are instructed to prepare three beds for the night, even though Letitia swears she thought she saw seven lords alight from the coach. 
Tertius has slipped a silver coin to Letitia, so he is not surprised at all when, shortly before midnight, when all is still, there comes a tap tapping on his door. Come. I'm here to warm your bed, my lord Tertius. <laughs> she holds a bottle of wine in her hand. Tertius leads the girl to the bed and, after undressing her, extinguishes the candle. After some time, he grunts and is still. Oh! <laughs> Poor sir! Are you finished already? Landlord! Landlord! A light here! Pose yourself, girl! He's dead, my Lord Primus! What's this buckle? Your other brother gave it me. He said it was a fine stiffener and would provide me with a night I would never forget. Ah, Septimus. Where is he now? He's gone, my Lord. Left an hour back. Damn him! What about your other brothers, sir? What other brothers? The grey ones standing at the end of the bed. Don't be ridiculous. Where's that landlord? <laughs> I thought Septimus had more imagination. That was the self-same preparation of Bainbury's he slipped into my dish of eels. Oh, my stars, they're ghosts! Ah! What a thumpingly stupid girl. Enthusiastic, though. Enjoy yourself, Tertius. Oh, shut up. The next morning, Lord Primus, alone in the coach, leaves the village of Nottaway in a significantly worse temper than when he arrived. Uh, uh, come on, Billy, stop your grumbling. I, Some considerable I, distance I, I from the inn stands a crossroads. Approaching it is Brevis, a dull-eyed boy dragging his unwilling goat to market. Mom's gonna kill me if you don't come. Waiting at the crossroads is a tall woman. It is the Witch Queen, the eldest of the three sisters of the Lillian. Beside her is a goat cart, its shafts Come empty. On. Come on. Oh. Uh, hello. What do they call you, boy? B B Brevis, Marm. Indeed. And will you sell me your goat? As you can see, I've nothing to harness to my cart. I cannot go far like this. I will give you a golden guinea. Will that do? Uh, yes, yes. Here is his halter. Thank you. Hmm. Now I consider this fine beast you've sold me, I think that a matched pair would be so much more impressive than just one, don't you? I, I don't know what you mean, lady. I... Bah, bah, bah. There. Two fine goats to draw my cart. <laughs> Forward! Oh, I can't walk far on this leg. We've made you a splint and a crutch. We'll get you to a proper doctor at the next town. Tristan and the Star have struggled out of the dell and find themselves walking towards a broad, open meadow. So, why did you fall? Did you trip over something? I did not trip. I was hit in the side by this. Oh, that looks like a topaz. They're quite valuable. And now I'm obliged to carry it about with me. Why? Shh. Listen. Oh, it's coming from my bed. Ow. Oh, the chain's not that long. On the meadow lies an ornate golden crown studded with red and blue stones. Fighting over it are two enormous beasts, a white horse and a huge lion. Tristan realizes that the horse has a long ivory horn jutting from the center of its forehead. The lion and the unicorn were fighting for the crown. The lion beat the unicorn all about the town. Oh, please do something. The unicorn's hurt. The lion will kill it. Oh, let him kill me too, quickly, while oh, they're getting their breath back. Stay there then. Here, kitty. Here. Look, here's your nice crown. Fetch! How about you, old fella? Poor 
creature. We can't leave it. His wounds aren't too deep. You could probably ride him. Will you carry the lady, please? <laughs> oh, my, my. Oh, it kneels before you. Climb up. Oh, oh, almost. Yes, I'm on. There. I can walk beside you both. Oh, I'm hungry. Aren't you hungry? Uh, we stars eat only darkness and we drink only light. So, no, I'm not hungry. Oh, look! There's a village on the other side of that hill. I'll go and get some food. You wait here. Wait here? Bound to you with this chain? Oh, yeah. Give me your hand. Oh, it's not coming off. Try your end. <sighs> oh, it's no good. Perhaps there's a magic word or something. Oh, I don't know any magic words, unless I just say please. Oh, that worked. Here, wrap it round your wrist till I return. I'll try not to be too long. I, I have to trust you on your honour as a star and not to run away. On this leg, Doa, I'll do no running for quite some time. I'll be back presently. Mm. Mm. Yes. It's Madame Samily, and the brightly coloured bird she keeps tethered on the silver chain. It is some 19 years since that bird, in human form, sold a certain Dunstan Thorn, a glass snowdrop at the fairy market, and nine months later, bore him a son. Madame Semily has stopped to eat, and her spell-enslaved servant, robbed of speech in her feathered state, is by someone approaching in a cart drawn by two fine billy goats. Uh, before you says anything, I should tell you that I'm just a harmless old biddy and that the sight of a grand and terrifying lady such as yourself fills me with dread and fear. I swear that by the rules and constraints of the sisterhood to which you and I belong, that I mean you no harm and shall treat you as if you were my own guest. That's good enough for me, dearie ducks. Come and sit down beside me. Supper will be cooked in two shakes of a lamb's tail. With goodwill. They call me Madame Semily. They called you Ditchwater Sal when you were a young chit of a thing. Oh, oh, no, no. You may call me Mordwanig. Yet now I feel you truly mock me, lady, for Morwanig means wave of the sea. Indeed. My true name was long since drowned and lost beneath the cold ocean. Oh. Would you partake of a little roast hare with me? Mm, I thank you. Salt? Oh, there's no salt, my dear. But if you shake this on it, it will do the trick. It's a little basil, a little mountain thyme, my own receipt. Mm. How is it, my dear? I can taste the basil and the thyme, but, but there's another taste I find harder to place, a most uncommon taste. Oh, that it is. It's a herb that grows only in Garamond. It is most pleasant with all manner of meats and fishes. It is good for wind and the ague, and has the curious property of causing one who tastes of it to speak nothing but the truth for several hours. <laughs> Limbus grass? You dare? To feed me limbus grass? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me now, Mistress Morwanig, where are you going off in your fine chariot? I am on my way to find a star, which fell in the great woods on the other side of Mount Belly. And when I find her, I shall take my great knife and cut out her heart while she lives and while her heart is her own. For the heart of a living star is a sovereign remedy against all the snares of age and time. My sisters wait for me to return. The heart of a star, is it? <laughs> Such a prize it will make for me. I shall taste enough of it that my youth will come back, and then I shall take all the heart that's left to the great market in wall. You shall not do this thing. No. You have stolen knowledge you did not earn. But it shall not profit you, for you shall be unable to see the star, unable to perceive it, unable to touch it, to find it, to kill it. Who are you? When you knew me last, I ruled with my sisters in Carnadine before it was lost. You? But you are dead. 
long dead. They have said that the Lilim were dead before now, but they have always lied. A moment after I leave, you shall forget that ever you saw me. You shall forget all of this, even my curse, although the knowledge of it shall vex and irritate you. Oh, my goodness. Whatever possessed me to cut that hair in two and then throw half away? Whatever was I a thinking of? I must be getting old, bird. Hello? The hay for the unicorn? Do they eat hay? Tristan returns, well fed from the village. Hello? Star? Oh. At first, he thinks that he must have made a mistake. But this is the same tree. The one beneath which he had left the star on the unicorn. Then, leagues away across the valley, he sees a light moving rapidly. But... she promised. <sighs> the star is to the southwest of him, travelling faster than he can ever run. She was right. I am a numbskull, a clodpole. I've let the fallen star escape. I'm lost and alone in the land of fairy. In the distant mountains, as the sun sets on their southernmost slopes, the witch queen reins in her goat-drawn chariot and sniffs the chilly air. Her red, red lips curve into a smile of such beauty, such pure and perfect happiness, that it would freeze your blood to see it. I smell it on the wind. The star travels west, and it is coming here to me. In episode one of Stardust, by Neil Gaiman. The narrator was Eleanor Bron. Tristan Thorne was Matthew Beard. And the star, Sophie Rundle. Dunstan was Brian Dick. Young Una, Charlotte Riley. Victoria Forrester, Ashling Loftus. Mordwaneg, Francis Barber. And Madame Semele, Maggie Steed. Primus was Nicholas Bolton. Secundus, Finley Robertson. Tertius, Alex McQueen. Quartus and the black silk top hat man, Sanjeev Baskar. Quintus, Tom Alexander. Sextus, Theo Mags. And Septimus, Blake Ritson. The little hairy man was Kevin Eldon. Louisa, Natasha Cowley. And Lord Stormhold, Michael Roberts. The Lillen were Karen Barkey and Claire Perkins. Revis, Gavi Sonchera. Letitia, Katrina McFarlane. And Seth, Neil Gaiman. Stardust was dramatized by Dirk Maggs and was directed by Dirk Maggs and Heather Lama. The producer was Heather Lama.